Vampire Remasquerade Bloodlines. A game which almost never came to fruition due to a development hell. A game which on modern systems would not even boot up without installing unofficial patches. But most importantly, a game which is the pioneer in the RPG genre and one which still holds up both in the gameplay and the story aspect. Hey guys, Barry Infos here, this will be an in-depth review of Bloodlines. A few months ago I had never even heard of the franchise, but after the announcement of Bloodlines 2, it piqued my interest. I checked it out and I played it for the first time. This video will be from the perspective of a brand new player, which means that I'll hold no nostalgia about the game. I don't have rose-tinted glasses and will call the game out on its flaws. And trust me, even though this game is incredible, some design decisions and overall quality is laughable at times. But more on that later, make sure you subscribe and of course like the video if you wanna see more in-depth reviews in the future and you enjoyed this one. Let's go! The year is 2001, almost two decades ago. Troika Games, a not-so-known development studio, had the idea of making an RPG in the first-person setting, a concept not often seen back then. They approached the publisher Activision. Yes, that Activision, the one which back then did not nickel and dime its customers, squeezing every single penny, adding loot boxes, pay to win bullshit and having a demon of a CEO disguised as a human being. Uh, sorry, I got a little carried away, but Activision back then had a very good track record. One successful franchise was Vampire the Masquerade. So Activision liked the idea and gave Troika the task of developing a standalone game in the franchise instead of a direct sequel to Redemption. Troika, being a small studio of five people, decided it would be a good idea to use the Source engine, which was created by Valve. Yes, that at Valve. The company which used to make games, not money, as opposed to now they make money instead of games. Since the engine was brand new, I mean even Half-Life 2 was not released, Troika had some trouble using it. They even had to rewrite some of the code, switch things around in the unfinished Source engine. A lot of rewrites had to be taken, a big one being the lighting engine. You can't have a Half-Life lighting in a scary vampire game, right? Well, rewriting the lighting was a hard task, but as you see, they succeeded. The team faced problems with the facial animations, clothing and many more. Luckily they had a very good idea about how the game would look and play out. In three years they made great progress, considering the fact that the engine was a foreign concept to them. Come 2003, Activision introduced Bloodline. But shortly after Valve experienced a security breach, so both Half-Life 2 and Bloodlines had to be delayed. The team was too ambitious. What they tried to accomplish was no easy task. Fast forward a few weeks and Activision forced the release and Troika was not happy. The game was unfinished, with glaring problems across the board. Players, for instance, can get stuck in a door and in fact. Do you know which the biggest enemy in the game is? No, 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 it's not the ghouls, the werewolves, brother canker, the high lord of diseased halls of the dead. The biggest enemy is the doors. In my playthrough, I had the most deaths and restarts because of doors. If you, for instance, open it up and immediately try to walk through it, that's it. You're stuck. No way in, no way out try and camp a door after opening it? Well, you better move fast, because it will slam shut and oh 
Oh, better restart and lose 20 minutes of progress. This is my biggest gripe with the game. Not the questionable writing, graphics, jankiness or anything else. Well, these things I should don't fall behind, there's a term which many people used called Eurojank. It describes a game which originates from Eastern Europe and is generally confusing, has questionable UI design and lacks tutorials. Games such as the original Witcher. You all know the incredible Witcher 3, right? It's well made, has fluid motion, incredible story, easy to understand UI, but the franchise began like this, as a Euro jank. And if I have to compare Bloodlines to any other game, it has to be The Witcher 1. Games so similar they could easily get confused if you don't know Geralt, the main character. Both have ghouls, werewolves, vampires. Point is, if you have played The Witcher, then definitely give this one a go. You feel right at home. But uh, is this all? Hell no, I can go on for a long time about how unpolished and broken the game is. But I really shouldn't. Most of you don't wanna hear me bash the game you most likely love. I mean, why would you even click on this video? Unless you wanna hear some praises and relive some nostalgia about your favorite childhood game. Just to be clear though, Bloodlines is one of the best RPGs I have ever laid my hands on, even as a new player. Despite the numerous problems, my time with Bloodlines was well spent. You start the game at the character creation tool. Here, unlike The Witcher, you can select who you play as. The gender does not matter since you don't even say a word in the game, and apart from some she said, he said changes in conversations, there is no difference. What is different is the clan. The choice is very important because your choice could determine how your playthrough could play out. Bruya, Gangrel, Toriador, Tremir, and Ventru don't have that much of a difference and are perfect for new players. What is a game changer is choosing either a Nosferatu or a Malkavian. Nosferatus cannot blend in with people and look very different from them. Therefore, walking around on the street is a no-go and you will get killed very often. What you need to do as a Nosferatu is to use the sewers. Random conversations are gone interesting dialogue as well, because once people see you, they will run away. But as a second time player, it is perfect because you always need to find alternative ways to traverse the map. As a Malkavian, oh boy, <laughs> don't choose this clan unless you want a massive bump in difficulty. Oh man, and you're a goddamn Malkavian too, wow. You really are fucked. Malkavians are considered as the weakest and weirdest vampires out there. I mean, they talk to science for crying out loud. Anyway, after you choose your clan, it's time for the skills. At the start, your choices would not really affect anything, you get lots of points later on and you can switch over to a different playstyle. Something else you notice here is the humanity meter and man, this is super interesting. You play as a vampire, obviously. And what do vampires do? Huh? They drink blood, drink too much blood though, and you may kill the person. If you stop at the right moment, they will be just dizzy. You have a full belly, you can walk around the block, return to the same place, and the person would still be there with a full blood meter ready for another round. If you do kill them though, you lose a point of humanity. The more points you lose, the more of a monster you become. Once all points are lost, you turn into a monster monster who cannot control themselves. We see this firsthand with some fellow vampires throughout the game. It drives them mad. Blood and murder is all they think about. This mechanic brings a nice balance to the game. You can for instance be a killer, but also do good deeds and regain some points. You can be a goody two-shoes and only do good, making some points of the game harder because you cannot flat out kill your enemy. Or just go to town and be a maniac. All valuable choices, which suit all playstyles. Think of it as the karma system in Fallout 3, but more fleshed out and it actually makes a huge difference in playstyles. The voices have proven themselves authentic and I have withdrawn from the vampire society entirely.
The game starts off with you waking up in a room after getting dirty, only to realize that you have been bitten and turned into a vampire. This is a big no-no in this world, because you are not allowed to convert people unless the prince says so. This butthole does not like it and sentence both of you and your partner to death. Only after the interruption from this fine gentleman, the ass face decides to release you, in the condition that you should do his bidding, but we'll get on to that later. This is when you're introduced to the world of Bloodlines, and meet one of the best characters in any video game ever, Rob Zombie! What? It's your new rack of lamp, your new champagne, not your new fucking heroin, kid. <laughs> get ready though, cause hey, it's never as sweet as the first time. Or just Jack, for you and me. This guy is badass, a very strong vampire, not holding anything back. He's sort of a companion throughout your playthrough, guiding you and helping you out, and here it's no exception. He teaches you how to fight, drink blood to heal, shows you who the bad guys are, shows your biggest enemy the door, and basically gives you a huge exposition dump. At first you may get slightly confused, but the game is long and you can catch up later on. On your path you'll meet many more interesting people, like this chick in the disco who is always horny slash playful slash scary slash crazy and so on. She's crazy to a whole different degree and that's why she's so memorable, one of my favorites in fact. Aside from her you meet gargoyles, the Chinese mob boss this kraken looking twat, and many, many, many more. By the time you finish this game you would remember all the names and where they spawn. The maps are small enough and traversing them is pretty easy, and man, I gotta mention the voice acting, it's superb! They found some incredible talents here, like this fatso head divan. Counterfeit. Man, I look like one of those peanut-headed, rock-smoking brothers selling S-H-A-C-K shirts they made at their mama's house. I'm the real deal OG man in the alley with what you need. Counterfeit. Why you gotta be like that? The butler look-alike. What? You don't recognize me from the pictures? Gorgeous Gary Golden? Janet. I'm not just some silly doll, you know. All my life, my sisters made me out to be a joke. She told you I was an embarrassment, didn't she? That I couldn't tie my shoes, let alone hold on to something for her. Is that it? And to many others. Yeah, they look janky and weird when they talk to you. They look even more weird while dancing, but they did a fantastic job with their voices. All these people slash monsters are members of different factions. We have the Camarilla, the Sabbat, who pretends to have massive dicks and try to take over the world by exposing themselves to humans. They kill on sight and ask no questions. The last major faction are the Honorks, who are basically outcast members of the Camarilla. They want order, don't want to expose themselves to humans and believe that humans and vampires could live together in a society. But they just hate this butt munch as much as I do and oppose his rule. And yes, you guessed it, the ending will depend on which faction you side with or not be your own vampire and choose neither, angering both the Camarilla and the Anarchs in the process. Yeah, it doesn't seem like much of a difference, but trust me, it is with the combination of choosing a clan at the beginning and the many, many, many different skills you can acquire and go for, you could easily complete this game 10 or more times and still try out something new with each playthrough. A big part of the game is the masquerade, hence the name. You need to keep your vampiric powers and special forms a secret because if you don't, there are some consequences. Don't eat people around others, don't shapeshift, don't talk to them about superficial stuff, and don't reveal critical info about your clan. This is an amazing concept, making you think outside the box. You are a monster and should act like one only when possible, otherwise things could get heated. It's just like real life. I mean, half of you are furries, but you would never tell me, right? 
Huh, moving on. Like any RPG, you take quests. Some important, others not so much. It's up to you which quest you should partake in and how you should go about completing them. This is where your clan comes in handy. Some are suited for stealth gameplay and others for straight up tank mode battles. Your disciplines are your friend and in them lies your success. More damage is always nice to have, but a shield could help too. Use them both and you risk dying because your blood meter is depleted. Pleated. Ok, so you can sneak around in an apartment, place some cameras and talk to this hideous creature so she can expose that this girl is... Uh, fat? Like that matters at all? I mean just look at her! Too fat! Big teeth in her complexion! Does she wash her face with a cheese grater? Or you may choose not to. You miss out on some great characters and dialogue unfortunately and part of the reason why this game took me 25 hours to complete is because I made sure to interact with anyone and anything I see so I can understand more about this forsaken world. Side quests and main quests in my view are of equal quality so I suggest doing both. Don't shove them aside. In fact some of the best missions are not mandatory like the one this fat so gives Gives you. Amazing guy, by the way. I love the dude. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, that's your business, okay? I just figured somebody with a shopping list like yours might be up for little actions, all, all right? He sends you in a parking lot where you need to kill, I assume, like a hundred people. Well, we're close to 60, I guess, but it feels like 100. This is the most action I have had in this game, and it was the biggest bullet waster ever. Glad I did it though, because the reward is well worth the effort. In contrast, some main missions are complete bollocks. One being the sewer level. Ugh, sewer levels probably where they began. They should have stayed here and not become so popular nowadays because the sewer levels sucked. It was one long corridor after the next. OP enemies at every corner, insta kill blades, locked off areas which take a while to get to, but whoa, oh, you forgot a key 10 miles away. Better traverse back and go get it. So, what happens is you find the key, come back, and whoa, oh, guess what? You should have pulled a lever 5 miles away. So, get your butt back there and oh, oh my goodness, see what. I'm going, I despise sewer levels and this is why. There are no interesting characters here, the scenery is non-existent. Just pipes, water and monsters. This is where you really can't avoid combat. Whereas previously fighting was just an option. You could sweet talk your way out of anything. Here we have hordes of enemies, all trying to kill you the moment they lay eyes on you. Combine that with the confusion of where to go and you get yourself a recipe of disaster. Luckily you don't spend too much time here and you can explore the towns as much as you want, finding secrets, hidden characters, I like this fine sophisticated and good Samaritan. Oh yes forgive me my name is Gimble, Stanley Gimble, but oh dear let us dispense with formalities. You can call me Stan. Oh, what a wonderful person, I just wanna hug him for being so good and loving. Or do you? Nope, 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 I'm not gonna spoil it, go play it, talk to him and you'll see what I mean. Oh, you have such beautiful arms. I absolutely must have them. One standout quest was the one in the Hunted Mansion. First of all, I'm a sucker of supernatural stuff like poltergeists and ghosts. This technically has both and my favorite character in the game is involved in a major way. I am Celeste. The moment you step inside it turns into a horror game. Items move on their own, they fly at you at random, you see visions of a woman running away, you hear screams, see monster-like figures, creepy childlike drawings and oh man, this place gave me the creeps.
In short, the quests you complete are vastly different from one another and you absolutely never do the same thing twice. In my 25 hour playtime, I never felt bored. Well, apart from the sewer level, but that was because of the wonderful quest design and the difference in locations. The towns you visit feel big, but in fact are not, and you know them by heart in no time. One has huge buildings and hotels, the other is abandoned, has a beach, strip clubs, and so on. This makes each location different and unique. And of course the combat has to be mentioned. It's a hit and a miss. While I love melee, range has a lot to be desired. Melee feels meaty. You can really feel the impact you do to the enemies, especially when you use a heavy two-handed axe or a sledgehammer. Slicing people with a knife is satisfying too, and overall melee is just fine. Only when you use your claws I have a problem, it doesn't feel impactful, and it's generally not safe to get that close and personal when bashing a monster. especially. Since you miss half the time you swing, that's where the long ranged weapons come in handy, kinda. <laughs> the majority suck, and I do really mean suck. The recoil on the Uzi is insane for instance, and I use it only as a last resort. Pistols take forever to reload, finding ammo is hard and expensive, and on top of that guns sound like toys. They don't feel impactful, and overall I avoided them as much as I can at all cost. But do you know what does sound great? Apart from the voice acting? The music! Guys, the music is incredible! The game introduced me to a new band I have never heard before. I'm a fan of metal personally, but the main reason why it's so great is because it fits perfectly well into the story and setting. There are monsters everywhere, dirty smelly bums around each corner, people selling drugs on the street, scary mansions, of course you would want a bad as upbeat hardcore soundtrack like this one. It gets your blood pumping and it's a great fit for the game, top notch stuff. In closing I just wanna say that I'm really sorry for not playing this game 15 years ago. I missed out big time, it's one of the best RPGs ever made. And as a new player, if you don't mind jank animations, some game breaking bugs, insta kill sections, weird animations and unfinished sewer sections, if you can look past all of that, you'll find an incredible game full of lore, great characters, a story which keeps you engaged throughout accompanied by a great soundtrack and voice work. I'm a huge fan of the franchise now and cannot wait to see what Vampire Masquerade Bloodlines 2 has in store for us. Hopefully it does not disappoint. Hurry up, I can only amuse myself for so long. Thank you for watching and a very special thank you goes to my lovely Patreon supporters. Austin Data, Vlados, How's the Chowder, Alex Chavez, Max Robinson and everyone else listed on the screen. Thank you so much for the support.